This video is for those of you who want a basic introduction into electricity. What is electricity? Electricity is the flow of electrons. In this circuit, we have a 1.5 volt battery connected to a light bulb, ideally a 1.5 volt light bulb. Electrons flow from the negative terminal of the battery through the light bulb and back to the positive terminal of the battery. As the electrons flow through the light bulb, they heat up the filament that is inside the light bulb. And when it gets hot, it generates light through incandescence. And so in this circuit, the chemical energy that's stored in the battery is converted into electrical energy, where the electrons are flowing in a circuit. And that energy is converted into light energy. Now, even though electrons flow from the negative side to the positive side, you'll find that many textbooks will define current flow as being from the positive side to the negative side. That is from a position of high potential to low potential. So just keep that in mind. Conventional current and the flow of actu actual electrons are in opposite directions. The electrical symbol of a battery looks like this. The long side is the positive side. The short side is the negative side. And let's connect it to a resistor. A resistor is a device that limits the flow of electrons in a circuit. It limits the current. Now there's something called Ohm's law, which is associated with this equation. So you spell it this way. So Ohm's law states that the voltage is equal to the current times the resistance. So let's say we have a six volt battery and we have a 50 ohm resistor. What is the current that is flowing in this circuit? Using Ohm's law, we can replace V with six and we can replace R with 50. Solving for I, which is the current, we need to divide both sides by 50. And so the amount of current that's flowing in this circuit is gonna be six divided by 50 which is 0.12 amps. Amps is the unit of current. You need to know that one amp is equal to 1,000 milliamps. So 0.12 amps, if you multiply by 1,000, that's equal to a current of 120 milliamps. So let's write this value here for now. Now you might be wondering, what exactly is current? What is electric current? Electric current represents the flow of electrons. It tells you the rate at which the electrons are flowing. Now you need to be familiar with this formula. Q is equal to IT. Q represents the electric charge. I represents the current and T is the time. So T is the time in seconds. The current is measured in amps. The electric charge is measured in coulombs. So one coulomb is equal to one amp times one second. So one coulomb of charge represents one amp of current flowing for a time period of one second. Electric charge represents the quantity of electrons. Current is the rate at which electrons are flowing. So you can think of current as the rate of charge flow or electric charge flow. Now, one electron has a charge of negative 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. So one coulomb of charge represents a certain quantity of electrons. If you take one and divide it by 1.602 times 10 to negative 19, you'll get that one coulomb of charge represents 6.242 times 10 to the 18 electrons. So make sure you understand that. Electric charge Q is related to the quantity of electrons. It tells you how many electrons are on a certain metal plate or on a conductor. Now, let me clarify what I mean. So let's say we have this metal plate. Metals are conductors of electricity. Electrons can easily flow in the metal. Insulators, they're the opposite. They don't conduct electricity. Rubber is an insulator. If you connect a battery to rubber to a light bulb, it's not going to light up. 
But if you connect a battery through a light bulb using metals, like a metal wire, it will light up. So metals can carry electricity. They're conductors, but insulators do not carry or conduct electricity. So let's say we have this metal with a charge of negative one coulomb. What does that mean? Now this metal contains both protons and electrons. Protons are positively charged particles. Electrons are negatively charged particles. So if this metal plate has a charge of negative one coulomb, it doesn't mean that it has 6.242 electrons on it. What it means is that there's 6.242 more electrons than protons. So it really tells you the difference between the protons and electrons because both of them are there. So I want to clarify that point. So if an object is negatively charged, it means that there's more electrons than protons. If it's positively charged, there's more protons than electrons. So make sure you understand that difference. If the charge is positive, there's more protons than electrons. If the charge is negative, there are more electrons than protons. And this relationship tells you how many excess electrons or excess protons there are based on the charge on that metal surface. Now let's go back to the concept of electric current, I. So we said that electric current is the electric charge divided by the time. So it tells us the rate of charge flow. And the charge tells us the quantity of electrons. So the current tells us the rate at which electrons are flowing in a circuit per second. So one amp is equal to one column of charge flowing every second. And we know that one column is equal to this number. So thus we can say that one amp of current is equal to 6.242 times 10 to the 18 electrons flowing every second. So that's what an amp means. It tells you how many electrons are flowing through a given wire per second. So it's the rate at which electrons are flowing or the rate at which charge, electric charge is flowing. Now, how can we increase or decrease the current and voltage in a circuit? Let's talk about batteries for a minute. If we want to increase the voltage provided by batteries, we can connect them in series. So here's a picture of two D-sized batteries connected in series. So the negative terminal of one battery is attached to the positive terminal of another battery. And each battery has a voltage of 1.5 volts. So if you were to connect this to a multimeter, the voltage that you'll read will be 3 volts. So whenever you connect batteries in series, the voltage will increase. So that's how you can increase the voltage generated by a battery. Now what about increasing the current generated by a battery? Let's talk about how we can do that. So we saw that if we connect two batteries in series, the voltage will increase. But if we connect them in parallel, the current will increase. So let's say we have a multimeter that's designed to measure the current flowing in a battery in a short circuit. Now let's say that when battery number one is shorted, it can release a current of 10 amps. And when battery number two is shorted, it can dish out a current of five amps. The current that's gonna be flowing in a meter is the sum of these two currents. So the total current is gonna be 15 amps. And so that's how you can increase the currents delivered by multiple batteries is by connecting them in parallel. Now let's talk about voltage. What is voltage? You can think of voltage as a force or pressure that drives electrons to flow from one point in a circuit to another point in a circuit. Voltage is the potential difference between two points in a circuit. So let's say we have a resistor and 
let's say at this point, we'll call it point A and point B. The potential, the electric potential at point A, we're going to say it's 30 volts. And the electric potential at point B is 10 volts. And let's say the resistance is 5 ohms. What is the voltage across the resistor? So the voltage is the potential difference between points A and B. It's the potential at A minus the potential at B. So the voltage is 20 volts. And with that, we can calculate the current. The current flowing in a resistor is the voltage across it divided by the resistance. So we have 20 volts across a 5 ohm resistor. There's going to be 4 amps of current flowing in this circuit. Now, what is the direction of conventional current in this resistor? Will the flow of current be from A to B or B to A? Current is going to flow from a high potential to a low potential. But keep in mind, the direction of electron flow is in the opposite direction. Electrons, which are negatively charged particles, they flow from a low potential to a high potential. They're going to flow towards the more positive side. Whereas conventional current represents the flow of positive charge, which flows towards the more negative side. Now, going back to voltage, one volt tells us how much work we can do per one column of charge. One volt means we can do one joule of work per one column of charge. A nine volt battery can do nine joules of work per one column of charge. It can also do 27 joules of work per three columns of charge. So voltage tells you how much work can be done per unit charge. The more charge that you have, the more work can be done. So work is equal to the charge times the voltage. But of course, there's a negative sign. Now let's work on an example problem that will bring these concepts into harmony with each other. So we have a 12 volt battery connected across a 4 ohm resistor. What is the current flowing through the resistor? I forgot the word the. Things happen. So we have a battery attached to a resistor. This is the positive side, this is the negative side, and it's a, a 4 ohm resistor. So let's begin by calculating the current flowing in this circuit. So the current is going to be the voltage across the resistor divided by the resistance. So it's 12 volts divided by 4 ohms. So thus we have a current of 3 amps flowing in the circuit. Now we can move on to part B. How much power is dissipated by the resistor? To calculate the power dissipated by the resistor is equal to I squared times R. So we have 3 amps of current flowing through the resistor times a resistance of 4 ohms. So that's 9 times 4, that's 36. The unit of electric power is the watt. And power tells you the rate at which energy flows. It's energy divided by time. 1 watt tells you that one joule of energy is being used up every second. So a 100 watt light bulb uses 100 joules of energy every second, or it could use 200 joules of energy every two seconds. So power tells you the rate at which energy is being transferred from one form to another. So the resistor is dissipating 36 watts of power. That means every second, the resistor is converting 36 joules of electric energy into heat or thermal energy. So that's the basic idea behind power dissipation. Now, let's answer the second part of the problem. How much power is delivered by the battery? The best way to calculate the power delivered by the battery is to multiply the voltage by the current. So there's three ways in which you can calculate power. is voltage times current is the square of the current times the resistance, or the square of the voltage divided by the resistance. You could use any one of those forms to calculate electric power. In the case of the battery, it's 12 volts times 3 amps, which will give us 36 watts. So the battery is delivering 
36 watts of power to the circuit and the resistor is consuming or using up 36 watts of power. So the battery converts 36 joules of chemical energy into electrical energy every second, but the resistor is converting 36 joules of electric energy into heat energy every second. So the rate at which energy flows into the circuit is equal to the rate at which energy flows out of the circuit. And this is in harmony with the law of conservation of mass and energy. Now let's move on to part C. How much electric charge will flow in this circuit for one minute? How can we find the answer to that? To calculate electric charge, we could use this formula. It's equal to, it's Q equal to IT. So we have a current of three amps and that current is flowing for a time period of one minute. One minute is 60 seconds. So three amps times 60 seconds is 180 amps times seconds. And an amp times one second is a coulomb. So we have a total of 180 coulombs of charge being transferred in one minute. Now, how much energy is consumed by the resistor in one minute? Make sure you understand the difference between power and energy. Power is measured in watts. Energy is measured in joules. Power is the rate at which energy flows. So we know the power dissipated by the resistor is 36 watts. And one watt represents one joule of energy being transferred or dissipated per second. So the resistor is dissipating 36 joules of energy every second. So if we multiply that by 60 seconds, which is one minute, we could see how much energy is being consumed by the resistor every minute. So it's 36 times 60. The unit seconds cancel. And so it's going to be 2,160 joules of energy being transferred or converted into heat every minute. So that's the answer for part D. That's how much energy is dissipated by the resistor in one minute. Now let's focus on part E because this is going to put everything together and help us understand the concept of voltage. How much work is done by the battery in one minute? We know the answer to that question, but we're going to get the answer using voltage. So recall that we said a one volt battery can do one joule of work when one coulomb of charge is flowing. Right now we have a 12 volt battery. So how many joules of work can a 12 volt battery do in one minute when there's a charge flow of 180 coulombs? Now we said that work is equal to the charge flow times the voltage. It's negative Q delta V. So the work done by the 12 volt battery is equal to the charge that's flowing, which when we're dealing with electrons, it's going to be negative 180 coulombs instead of positive 180 times a voltage of 12 volts. So 180 times 12 is equal to, guess what, 2,160 joules. So that's how much work is being done by this uh, battery. So you have two ways in which you can calculate work. You can multiply the power by the time, or you can multiply the charge by the voltage. And so it really helps us to see the concept of voltage. That is, voltage represents the work that a charge can do. You can also think of it as the change of electric potential energy per unit charge. Electric potential energy is measured in joules and the change in electric potential energy is equal to negative work or work is equal to negative change in electric potential energy. So some textbooks will describe voltage as being the change in electric potential energy per unit charge. Others will describe it as how much work the battery can do per one unit of charge. So at this point, we've covered voltage and current. We talked about resistance, but not really in detail. So we know that the electrical symbol for a resistor is uh, that, and uh, it's measured in ohms. Now there's another term called conductance. Conductance is, you can think of it as the opposite of resistance. They're inversely related to each other. 
conductance is represented by the symbol G, and it's 1 divided by the resistance. The unit for resistance is the ohm. The unit for conductance is Siemens. So a 1 ohm resistor has a conductance of 1 Siemens. A 10 ohm resistor has a conductance of 0.1 Siemens. And a 0.1 ohm resistor has a conductance of 10 Siemens. So whenever the resistance goes up, the conductance of the conductor goes down. Now resistance is equal to the resistivity times the length of the conductor divided by the area of the conductor. So taking that formula into account, let's say we have two materials. Material A and material B. So they both have the same thickness, but A is longer than B. Which of these two materials would you say has more resistance? A is going to have more resistance. The reason for that is because the length is longer. Whenever you increase the length of a conductor, the resistance goes up because L is in the top part of the fraction. Whenever you increase the numerator of a fraction, the value of the fraction goes up. If you increase the denominator of a fraction, the value of the fraction goes down. So what you want to take from this is that longer wires have more resistance than shorter wires. When dealing with long wires, you need to know what is the resistance per unit length. For example, a wire may have 2 ohms of resistance for every 500 meters or so. And so if you have a, a wire that's a thousand meters long, the resistance could be four ohms. So when dealing with very long wires, you want to know what is the resistance per unit length. Maybe the resistance might be 0 0.01 ohms per you know, foot of wire. So that becomes important when you need to build something that has very long wires. Now, let's look at another situation. So let's say we have two conductors, conductor A and conductor B. Now, both of these conductors, let's assume that they have the same length. Which of these two conductors have more resistance, A or B? So A is thicker than B. B is a lot thinner. So would you say the thin wire has more resistance or the thick wire? Well, in this case, we need to take into account area. If we increase the area of a conductor, the resistance will decrease because there's more space for the electrons to flow. You could think of electron flow as cars on the highway. Conductor A is like a highway that has three lanes. Conductor B is like a highway with one lane. A one-lane highway is not going to allow many cars to flow through it at any given point especially if you have a slow driver in front of you. But that is conductor B. Conductor B is like the slow highway. Conductor A, that's a highway with three lanes, so that's going to allow more traffic to flow. And so this conductor has less resistance. It's going to be easier for electrons to flow through the thicker wire because there's more space, more room to flow. So thus B is the conductor with a higher resistance. So as you decrease the area of a conductor, the resistance increases. So make sure you understand this. Long wires, long thin wires have high resistance, whereas shorter, thicker wires have low resistance. I'm going to say that one more time. Longer and thinner wires have higher resistance, whereas shorter and thicker wires have a much lower resistance. Now let's move on to the next topic associated with resistance. And it has to do with this symbol. That's the Greek symbol rho, which represents the resistivity of the material. So let's look at two different materials. Ag, that's the chemical formula for silver. And uh, let's look at Cu, the chemical symbol for copper. Because most conductors, most metal wires that you'll encounter, 
are typically copper wires, but sometimes you may encounter silver wires. The question is, which one has more resistance, a copper wire or a silver wire? Now they're pretty close, but one has more resistance than the other. And to find the answer, you need to look at something called resistivity. Each material has its own resistivity. Now the resistivity for silver, I have my textbook right in front of me, is 1.59 times 10 to the minus 8. And the resistivity for copper is 1.68 times 10 to the minus 8. So they're pretty close. But which one has more resistance, a copper wire or a silver wire? In this case, the copper wire has more resistance because it has a higher resistivity. As the resistivity goes up, the resistance increases as well. So here are some things you want to know. Metals like silver, copper, aluminum, these are conductors. They conduct electricity. And as a result, they have a very low resistivity. As you saw in the case of silver and copper, we're talking about on the order of 10 to the minus 8. It's very, very low. So they have a very low resistance, thus they have a very high conductance. Semiconductors, sometimes called semi-metals, semiconductors or in chemistry it's referred to as metalloids. These are like uh, silicon, germanium. They don't have a very low resistance but it's fairly low. The resistivity is somewhat low. In the case of germanium it's on the order of 10 to the minus 3. In the case of silicon it varies from 1 to 60. So it's still pretty low for the most part. Now, insulators, which are not conductors, they have a very high resistivity. In the case of glass, it's on the order of 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 12 for the resistivity. So insulators have a very high resistivity, low conductance. Metals have a very low resistivity high conductance, and semiconductors are in the middle. Now, there's another aspect that can affect the resistance of a conductor, and that is the temperature. So let's say we have two copper wires. Let's say wire A, wire B. So both of these are metals. One is at 25 degrees Celsius and the other is heated to 100 degrees Celsius. So this one is at room temperature, and the other one is uh, it's very hot. So which one will have more resistance, the hot wire or the cool wire? What would you say? Now there's a formula that helps us to calculate the resistivity. And the resistivity is dependent on the temperature. Alpha is the temperature coefficient, and for metals, it's positive. So because metals have a positive temperature coefficient, the resistivity of a metal is proportional to the temperature. So as the temperature goes up, the resistivity of a metal goes up, and therefore its resistance goes up. So metals at higher temperatures, they will have a higher resistance. So metal B is going to be more resistive or have a greater resistance than metal A. So whenever you decrease the temperature of a metal, the resistance decreases. So conductor A is uh, more conductive to electricity. So if you cool a metal to a very, very low temperature, close to absolute zero, it can become a superconductor where its resistance is virtually zero. Now, this is opposite when dealing with uh, semiconductors. For instance, a semiconductor like germanium has an alpha value of negative 0.05. So because of that, for semiconductors, whenever you increase the temperature, the resistivity goes down. 
and so the resistance go down. But with metals like copper and silver, they have a positive temperature coefficient. When you increase the temperature, the resistivity go up and the resistance goes up. So make sure you understand that. Metals have higher resistance at higher temperatures, but semiconductors or metalloids, they have a lower resistance at higher temperatures. And it's due to the sign of the temperature coefficient. Now let's get into circuits. Consider these three circuits. What is the difference between them? So that's the first circuit. And here is the second circuit. And here is the third circuit. What are the names of these three circuits? The first circuit is called a closed circuit. Whenever you have a closed circuit, you have a path for the current to flow. So these are normal circuits in operation. The second circuit on the right, this is called an open circuit. This is the electrical symbol of a switch. So because there's no contact between those two points in the circuit, it's open. So there's no current flow in the circuit. So the current is equal to zero. This, it's a special type of closed circuit. It's called a short circuit. A short, let me say that again. A short circuit is a circuit with little or no resistance. We have no resistors in a circuit. So therefore, there's virtually no impedance to current flow. Without a resistor, you're going to have a large amount of current flowing in a circuit, which is dependent on the internal resistance of the battery. And whenever you have a large amount of current flowing through a wire, it's a dangerous situation because the wire can heat up and it can get very hot and cause a fire. It can burn the electronics surrounding it, and it's not a good situation. And so to protect a circuit from dangerous high levels of current, what you can do is add a device called a fuse. So let's say D is your device. A fuse is basically a device with a, a very thin wire inside of it. And when the current is too high, this wire snaps and prevents the device from being damaged by the heat generated by this excessive current. Now the symbol for a fuse looks like this when drawn circuits. So that's a symbol for a fuse. But this is how it looks like if you're going to buy it in real life. These are the, the two metal pieces. And there's a thin filament on the inside, which snaps when the current flowing through it reaches its rated maximum. So a 10 amp fuse will only allow a maximum of 10 amps of current to flow through it. Anything more than that, it's going to snap. You have 20 amp fuses, 1 amp fuses, 100 amp fuses, and they vary. But they're designed to create a break in the circuit once the maximum current has been reached. So at this point, we've covered open circuits, closed circuits, and short circuits. There's also two other types of circuits that you need to be familiar with. A series circuit and a parallel circuit. Now we talked about these terms earlier in the video, but let's go into more detail with them. Now resistors connected in series look like this. Whenever you have a series circuit, there's only one path for the current to flow. Let's call this resistor one and resistor two. The total resistance of two resistors in series is the sum of the individual resistors. Now, when you connect two resistors across each other, they are in parallel. In a parallel circuit, there's multiple paths for the current to flow. So as the current enters this branch, it can flow through branch A or branch B. The equivalent resistance of two resistors in parallel, it's going to be 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 raised to the minus 1. In some textbooks, you'll see it like this. So make sure you understand the difference. A series circuit only has one path for the current to flow, but a parallel circuit has multiple paths 
for the current to flow. In a series circuit, the current flowing through each resistor is the same. In a parallel circuit, the voltage across parallel resistors are the same. Now, as you add resistors in a series circuit, the total resistance goes up. Whenever you add resistors in a parallel circuit, the total resistance goes down. As the total resistance goes up, the current goes down. When the total resistance goes down, the current goes up. So whenever you add more resistors in parallel, the total current being drawn from the power source increases because the total resistance goes down. In the series circuit, as you add more current, the total resistance goes up. And now you can actually test that. Let's say if you connect a battery to two light bulbs in series, a light bulb is it's like a resistor because it can resist the amount of current flowing through it. So let's say you connect two light bulbs in series and compare that circuit between this circuit where if you connect two light bulbs in parallel and these have to be identical light bulbs. What you'll find is that the light bulbs in series, they will be dimmer. And the reason for this is because there's less current flowing in the circuit, whereas the two light bulbs in the parallel circuit on the right, they're going to be a lot brighter because more current is flowing to each light bulb in that circuit than the ones in series. And for those of you who want to see this uh, phenomenon, I'm going to post a video or a link to a video in the description section below where you could see this, you know, demonstration taking place. So light bulbs placed in series will be dimmer than light bulbs placed in parallel to each other. Now let's work on some math problems. So let's say we have a battery and two resistors connected in series. And let's say this is, we're going to use a 30 volt battery. And we're going to say this is a 2 ohm resistor and a 6 ohm resistor. I mean a 4 ohm resistor. Let's call this R1 and R2. Calculate the current flowing through the circuit in this, in this problem. And also calculate the voltage across each resistor. When solving a circuit problem with resistors in series, the first thing you want to do is calculate the total resistance. So it's R1 plus R2. That's 2 plus 4 ohms, so the total resistance is 6 ohms. The next thing that you want to do is calculate the current flowing in the circuit. The current is going to be the voltage across the two resistors divided by the total resistance of the two resistors. So we have 30 volts across it and 6 ohms for the total resistance. 30 divided by 6 is 5. So we have 5 amps of current flowing through this circuit. So now, if we want to calculate the voltage across R2, it's going to be I times R2, according to Ohm's law, V equals IR. So we have 5 amps of current flowing through a 4 ohm, let me say that again, a 5 amp current flowing through a 4 ohm resistor. So 5 times 4 is 20. So the voltage across R2 is 20 volts. Now to calculate the voltage across R1, it's going to be the current flowing through it times R1. So it's 5 amps times 2 ohms, that's 10 volts. So notice that the voltage drop across each resistor, these two voltage drops add up to the voltage of the battery. And this is in harmony with Kirchhoff's voltage law, which states that the sum of the voltages in a closed circuit must add up to zero. So let's call this the ground. And we're going to assign it a potential of zero volts. As we travel from the negative side to the positive side of the battery, the voltage increases because the battery provides energy to the circuit. So let's call this point A, point B, and point C. So going from point A to point B, we have a voltage rise of 30 volts. Now the resistors, they consume energy. So as we go from point B to point C, that's a voltage drop of 20 volts. So the potential at C will be 10 volts. And as we go from C to A, 
that's another voltage drop of 10 volts. So the sign across R1 is positive and negative. So as you go from negative to positive, that's a voltage rise. And as you go from positive to negative, it's a voltage drop. So the science tells you the direction in which energy is changing in a circuit. So in harmony with Kirchhoff's voltage law, abbreviated KVL, the sum of the voltages in a closed circuit must add up to zero. So the voltage of the battery plus the voltage across R1 plus the voltage across R2 must add to zero. Now, we saw that we had a voltage rise for the battery since it provides energy to the circuit. So that's positive 30. With the voltage across R1, I believe that one was 10, but it consumed energy from the circuit, so it's a voltage drop of 10 volts. And R2 also consumed energy from the circuit, so that's a voltage drop of 20 volts. So the sum of the voltages in a closed circuit must be zero because you have certain elements that are delivering power to the circuit while other elements are consuming power to the circuit such that there's no net gain or net loss. Energy is conserved. Now, for those of you who want more example problems on solving series and parallel circuits, check out the description section below because I'm going to post another link with another video on that topic. So now let's talk about how we can solve a parallel circuit. So let's put three resistors, actually just two resistors in parallel. We'll keep it simple. So we're going to say we have a 4 ohm resistor and a 3 ohm resistor and a 12 volt battery across it. So calculate the current flowing through each resistor. We'll call this one R1 and this R2. So to calculate the current flowing through R1, we could use V is equal to IR. The voltage across the 4 ohm resistor is 12 volts. The current flowing through it, we need to find R1 is 4. So 12 divided by 4 is 3. So thus we have a 3 amp current flowing through the 4 ohm resistor. Now to calculate the current flowing through R2, it's going to be the voltage across it divided by R2. So that's 12 volts divided by 3 ohms. And so there's a 4 amp current flowing through the 3 ohm resistor. Now how much current is flowing from the battery? So in the series circuit, we talked about Kirchhoff's voltage law. In a parallel circuit, we need to talk about Kirchhoff's current law, which states that the sum of the currents entering and leaving a junction adds up to zero. So let's call this I1, I2, and let's call this IB. So IB plus I1 plus I2 must equal to zero. So let's focus on this junction here. IB is the current that is entering that junction. I1 is leaving the junction and I2 is leaving the junction. So because IB is, well, first, what is IB? Intuitively, we know that we have four amps of current going here, three amps of current going here. If seven amps of current is leaving point A, that means that seven amps of current must enter point A because the amount of current that enters a point must equal the amount of current that leaves the point. Now, IB, we're going to say it's positive 7 because that's current that's entering the junction. I1 is going to be negative 3 because it's leaving the junction, and I2 is negative 4, so that these numbers add up to 0. So the total current flowing into and out of a junction must add up to 0. So that's the basic idea behind Kirchhoff's current law. So now we know the current flowing from a battery. It's the sum of I1 and I2, so it's 7 amps. And with this information, we can now calculate the power delivered by the battery and also the power absorbed by each resistor. So let's go ahead and do that. We know that power is voltage times current. We have a 12 volt battery dishing out 7 amps of current. So the battery is delivering 84 watts 
to the circuit. Now to calculate the power dissipated by the first resistor, it's going to be I squared times R. We have 3 amps of current flowing through it and a resistance of 4. 3 squared is 9 times 4, that's 36. So resistor 1 is dissipating 36 watts. In the case of resistor 2, it's I2 squared times R. So the current there is 4 amps. 4 squared is 16 times 3. That gives us a power of 48 watts. So that's how much power is being dissipated by R2. As you can see, 36 plus 48 is equal to 84. So the total power dissipated by the two resistors is equal to the power delivered by the battery, which is in harmony with the law of conservation of energy. So that's basically it for this problem. For those of you who want more example problems on solving parallel circuits, check out the links in the description section below as I'll be putting more resources there. Now let's talk about certain types of circuit elements that you may want to be familiar with. This is the electrical symbol of a diode. A diode is a special device because for all practical purposes, it allows current to flow in one direction while blocking current from flowing in the other direction. This is the positive side of the diode and this is the negative side. The positive terminal is known as the anode. The negative terminal is the cathode. So when current flows from the anode to the cathode, this is conventional current, by the way, not electron flow, the diode is said to be forward bias. For silicon diodes, the voltage drop is between 0.6 and 0.7 volts. So you need at least 0.6 volts to activate the diode in the forward direction. For germanium diodes, the voltage drop is about 0.3 volts. If you try to connect the diode in the other way, this is in reverse bias mode. For the most part, the diode will be off. Now it does have a reverse breakdown voltage, which could be 100 or 200 volts. So if you have a high voltage connected to a diode in reverse, if the voltage is high enough, it could force the diode to conduct. But for practical purposes, the diode is off in reverse bias mode, but it's on in forward bias mode. Now, there are special types of diode called LEDs or light emitting diodes. In this case, they have the same symbol of a diode, but you'll see two arrows pointing away from it. The diode will be on when the, the current flowing through it is in the forward bias mode. So let's say we have a 9 volt battery connected to a resistor and let's say a green LED. And here's another circuit where we have something similar. Now, which circuit is on and which one is off? What would you say? The circuit on the left, is it on or off? We know that conventional current will flow from the positive terminal of the battery, and it's going to flow through the LED in this direction. So it's in the forward bias mode. In this case, the circuit will be on. The voltage drop of a typical green LED is 2 volts, so you need at least 2 volts to activate it. For the other circuit, the current is flowing through the LED in the reverse direction. So this LED will be off. For a typical red LED, the voltage that you may need is close to 2 volts to activate it. It's about 1.8 volts. But because it's in reverse bias mode, that LED is off. So an LED, a light emitting diode, will only turn on if the minimum voltage requirement is met and also if it's connected the right way. It will allow current to flow through it in one direction while blocking current from flowing through it in the other direction. So no current will flow in this circuit. Now, here's a question for you. How can we determine the amount of current flowing in a circuit on the left? So we have a 9-volt battery, an LED with a voltage drop of 2 volts, 
And let's say we have a 1 kilo ohm resistor. How can we calculate the amount of current flowing through that circuit? Well, let's call this the ground level. And so the potential there will be 0. The potential at this point is 9 volts. We know the voltage drop across the LED is 2 volts. So the potential at this point, let's call it, we'll say this is point A, point B, point C. The potential at point C will be 2 volts with respect to the ground. So the potential or the voltage across the 1 kilo ohm resistor is 9 minus 2. To calculate the current flowing through a resistor, you need to take the voltage across it and divide it by the resistance. And the voltage across it is the potential difference between the two points across the resistor. So it's 9 volts minus 2 volts divided by the 1 kilo ohm resistor. Now, if you divide it by 1,000, 1 kilo ohm is 1,000 ohms, you'll get 7 divided by 1,000, which is 0 0.007 amps. Now, if you divide it this way, if you take the 7 volts across it and just divide it by the 1 kilo ohm resistor, you'll get 7 milliamps, which is equivalent to 0 0.007 amps. So those are two ways in which you can calculate the current flowing in a circuit. For those of you who want more videos on diodes and LEDs and the calculations associated with it, again, check out the links in the description section below. Now, I'm going to post some other content which I wasn't able to cover in this video. The first is capacitors. Capacitors can store electrical energy. You could use them in circuits not only to store energy, but to increase the voltage of a battery, which I'm going to talk about how to do that. And there's also inductors. Inductors store energy in their magnetic fields, whereas capacitors can store energy in the electric fields. And inductors and capacitors, they can both boost the voltage of a circuit. And then there's transformers. Transformers can boost the voltage of an AC circuit, whereas you can use inductors and capacitors to boost the voltage of a DC circuit. DC stands for direct current, whereas AC stands for alternating current. In direct current, current flows in one direction. In the case of a battery, a battery provides direct current in a circuit. So you have a constant voltage flowing in one direction. Now think of the power that you get from the wall when you plug in a device into the wall socket. That's AC, alternating current. Alternating current reverses direction. And as you can see, the voltage varies. It increases to its maximum and then decreases to negative V. In a typical household, the voltage is 120 volts AC with a frequency of 60 hertz which means that the current reverses 60 times per second. So that's the difference between DC and AC. Now, for those of you who want more videos on capacitors and how you could use them to boost the voltage of a circuit or how you can use inductors to increase the voltage of a battery, I'm going to post more videos on uh, that topic as well. And also how you can convert AC to DC, which is also useful. You can use diodes to do that. So I couldn't cover everything in this video. There's a lot of other topics, but I'm just going to be posting other videos in the description section below. So thanks again for watching this video. If you like it, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and hopefully you'll check out one of those other videos. Thanks for watching.